Hello everyone and welcome to an APA tutorial on APA formatting using the 7th edition. APA is both a method of citation, for instance how you cite references in text and in the reference list, and a method of formatting. In other words, there's a particular style that APA uses that includes things like how you organize your title page, how you organize the manuscript itself with document headers, how you report statistics. So in this introduction to APA style, I'm going to go through three different levels of investigation. First, we'll look at the basics of APA overall. Then we'll look at the, the more particular picky details around APA formatting. And then we'll talk about topographical style, which includes things like the title page and the headings. All right, let's begin with the basics. And of course, we start with references in text. APA 7 is no different from APA 6 when it comes to citing references in text. The APA methodology involves what is known as the author date method of citation. In other words, whenever you are citing a reference, you include the author's last name only, not first initials, just last name, and then the date of the research study that you are referencing. So you can see two examples up here on the slide, two different approaches to how we might cite um, a source. In the first, we cite the um, the author first, and then we talk about what the author found. So for instance, APA uses the author date method with Peterson, and then in brackets, 2008, which is the year of the study, and then what the study found. So in this case, investigated the use of what are known as sex bracelets in a sample of adolescents. The second method that you might use is where you discuss what the author found first, and then reference the author. So in the second example, the use of sex bracelets among adolescent girls was not predictive of actual sexual behavior. And then in brackets, Peterson, the author's last name, is separated by a comma and followed by the year of that publication. In APA, the format of how you cite references and text change depending upon how many authors are cited in the research that you are reporting. When there are two authors, you always cite both of them every time. So you can see in this top example, we have the same method that we used in the last top example where we discuss the authors first, then we discuss their finding. So in this case with two authors, Kara and Peterson in brackets 2020, examined whether traditional gender role endorsement belief in male sexuality stereotypes and age predict mild sexual compliance among heterosexual men. And then in the second example where you discuss the research finding first and then the authors, the reported incidence rate of mild, that is consenting to unwanted kissing at least once, sexual compliance in heterosexual men was 61.3% over the past 12 months. And then again in brackets, both authors, Kara and Peterson, a comma, and then the year and bracket. So take note, when you are citing in text, you spell the word and between the author's name, as we can see up here. When you are citing um, in brackets, you use what is known as the ampersand symbol, as you can see here. That is always the case. When there are more than two authors, you use the abbreviation notation et al. every time. That's Latin for and others. So we have a few examples here. Peterson et al. 2015 investigated differences between exotic dancers and university students on numerous personality dimensions. So that's the same example as from, uh, or the same method from the, from as in the previous two slides where you discuss the authors first and then their finding. The personality variable of extroversion was not significantly different between dancers or female university students. This is the second approach where you discuss the findings first, then you cite the authors. And then last, Peterson et al. are among the first researchers to formally investigate what has previously been based on anecdotal evidence. Peterson et al. shared a good time talking about sex. Notice in this third example that there is no year provided after this second citation. That is because whenever you are discussing the same authors, the same research study, that is, in the same paragraph, um, you no longer have to cite subsequent years. So we've already said Peterson et al. 2015. So because this Peterson et al. is the same study and it's in the same paragraph, we do not have to provide the year. Once we move on to a new paragraph, however, and we go back to talking about Peterson et al., then we will again have to cite the year in subsequent paragraphs. Take note, there is no comma after al when it is used in text, only when it is used in brackets. 
So for instance, up here, we have Peterson et al. 2015. Notice there is a period after uh, AL, but there is no comma. Whereas in brackets, Peterson et al., like here, and we do have to provide the comma to separate the authors from the year. When the author is a group or organization, such as the National Institute of Mental Health, for instance, um, you would cite like so, the first example. Some research suggests that mental illness among children are on the rise. This is from the National Institute of Mental Health. And then in a hard bracket, we provide the acronym NIMH, comma, and then the year. And then in subsequent citations, we no longer have to type out National Institute of Mental Health. We can just go ahead and use the acronym NIMH because we have already introduced it fully in a previous sentence. So notice the difference between the first and the second citation. When there are two or more works within the same parentheses, they should be listed in the same order that they appear in the reference list. In other words, this is alphabetical order. Okay. So for instance, it has been proposed that those with robust sexual histories, a thorough education in the subject matter, or those entirely lacking exposure to sexually explicit material content may not be as heavily influenced by the material presented in this study. So here are a bunch of authors that have all investigated robust sexual histories, a thorough education in the subject matter, etc. Okay. Hald comes first because H is first in this list of authors, then Johnson, then Morrison. Okay. So it's alphabetical. Note that the authors are separated from one another by semicolons there and there. And note also that when the same author has two citations, they are both listed by year in brackets and separated by a comma. So for instance, there are two studies that are um, part of this set of, of researchers uh, that all looked at sexually explicit content. Morrison did a study in 2004 and then Morrison did another study in 2006. It is the same Morrison. If it's a different Morrison, then obviously you can do this. But because it is the same Morrison, you just put uh, 2004 comma 2006 to illustrate to your reader that this is the same Morrison, but two separate studies. When you are using direct quotes, and for the record, they should only be used sparingly for effect according to APA formatting, you must cite the page number from where you quoted the source. So for instance, here we have a quote, the public largely continues to view people with mental illness as objectionable, dangerous, and largely unpredictable. This is a quote by Segal in 1978, and that quote can be found in the article on page 215. Note that you only use the letter P if there is one page, as in this example, or PP if the quote crosses over two pages. So for instance, you, if there were two, if this quote crossed over two pages of the article, you would put PP period 215-216. Okay. Uh, notice that, of course, it's P and PP, not the letters PG, which we frequently use to indicate page. And again, I can't state strongly enough that direct quotes should be used sparingly. I have read papers where every single sentence includes a direct quote. That is not good writing. Um, writing should be your own, and direct quotes should only be used for effect. For sources that do not provide a page number, and these would often be electronic sources, you would have to find another way to cite where to find that quote, in which case you would use the heading that is provided by the article and the paragraph number from where the quote was found. So for instance, in his study, Segal, 1978, argued that the public largely continues to view people with mental illness as objectionable and dangerous. Let's pretend that this isn't an actual published article. In fact, it's an article that I found online. Uh, there are no page numbers, and so I would direct the reader to this quote by saying, I found this quote in the discussion section, and it was found on paragraph five, in paragraph five. And so you use the abbreviation para with a period followed by the paragraph's number. Paragraph 5. How do references appear in the reference list for APA formatting? Well, um, this is no change from APA 6. References cited in the text must appear in the reference list. 
And conversely, each entry that is in the reference list must also appear in the text. So I know many students think it's fancy to cite every single book that they've even glanced at or every single article that they brought up onto the computer, whether or not they actually read that article uh, in order to beef up or fill out their references um, so that they meet the required number of references that, that a professor might assign. That is not appropriate. You should only be citing something in your manuscript or your document or your art or your, your paper if you have actually read it, in which case you would cite it in text and then there would be a corresponding reference list citation that goes along with that. And again, by the same token, you shouldn't be citing books and articles in your reference list that are not actually referenced in the text itself. So it's going to require work on your part to actually read the things that you are referencing. The one exception here is what is known as personal communications. Personal communications would be cited in text with in brackets that say, for instance, Peterson, comma, personal communication, um, but they do not have to be included in the reference list. Personal communications are anything like, um, well, communications you've had with somebody. So maybe email or maybe in a phone conversation or maybe in a classroom conversation or discussions that occur in a classroom environment would all be considered personal communications. APA 7 uses much like APA 6, the hanging indent style in the reference list. What that means is that the very first line of every reference is flush to the left, and then every line underneath that reference will be indented five spaces. This is called the hanging indent style. When you are ordering one author entries by the same author, they should be organized with the earliest first. So of course I said earlier that the reference list, first of all, is alphabetical. So authors with the last name A come before those with the last name B, come before those with the last name C, etc. But what happens if you have two authors that have the same last name and they are the same author as you can see in this example here? Well, then they are or organized chronologically. So for instance, we have two authors here, Jay Dunn. She did a study in 1995 and another study in 1999. Um, if you're battling, how do I know which one goes first? It goes by year of the publication. So 1995 comes before 1999 and so Dunn comma J would come be, uh, 1995 would come before that same author from 1999. One author entries precede multiple author entries every time beginning with the sur when they begin with the same surname and this is regardless of the year of the publication. So for instance we have uh, Costello here in 2000 and then Costello um, uh, cozied up with another researcher, Angold, in 1990. So Costello alone will always come before Costello and somebody else. And if it doesn't matter what year these are published, um, one author entries precede multiple author entries every single time. Note also that you only use the ampersand symbol in the reference list. So here we have Costello and Angold, and is the ampersand symbol, not the spelling of the word and, unlike in text where if you're discussing two authors, Kara and Peterson, in text, they would be um, separated by the spelling of the word and, unless, of course, they are in brackets at the end of the sentence or at the end of a line um, or following a, a um, specific reference uh, in text, then you would, of course, in brackets, use the ampersand symbol. References with the same first author and different additional authors are arranged by the surname of the second author. So, for instance, we have an example here where Denim is the first author in both of these cases, and then uh, Denim uh, buddied up with Bellaud um, and in one study, and then in a separate study, um, cozied up with McKinley, Cushode, and Holt. So, because the letter B comes before the letter M, then we are going to have um, B. Denim and Billoud coming before Denim and McKinley, etc. References by the same author or the same two or more authors with the same publication date are arranged alphabetically by the title of the article. So, for instance, here we have an example where Bibachi and Walsh did two different studies, as you can see, both of them done in 1980. So, how do we decide which one goes first? The one that goes first is the one that has the uh, alphabetical title that comes first in the alphabet. So development, D in development, comes before E in epidemiology. So these are organized in the reference list in this way so that development comes before epidemiology. 
Now you would identify these as A and B. So you sort of see indicated here, there's the letter A following 1980 in that study, and then the letter B following 1980 in that study. And you would do that in the reference uh, list as well as in text. So in text, when you're talking about the development of children's concepts of illness article, you would put Babachi and Walsh, 1980A. And when you were talking about the epidemiology of childhood disorders in a cross-cultural context article, you would put Babachi and Walsh, 1980B, so that as a reader, I would be able to find these two separate articles independently. Authors' names are now listed up to 20 in APA 7. This is different from APA 6, where it was only the first, um, you would list the first six, and then you would uh, put ellipses, ellipses to indicate the very last. Now they want 20 authors' names listed in the reference list. So in this example here, you can see that we have the first 19 authors listed that are then separated from the 20th by these ellipses, as you can see here, right? So we have Miller, Brown, Wilson, Evans, Kelly, Turner, Lewis, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to the 19th author, who is green. And then we go period, 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 no spaces there. And then Lee is the 20th author. And we now have a total of 20 authors um, in this reference list. So when there are more than 20, so in other words, 21 or more, you would list only the first 19, and then you would list the very last, making it a total of 20 authors in this list. Okay, let's move on to part two, the picky details. And they are very, very picky. So the... Um, the, the, the beginning of this, of this part of the lecture will start with APA reference list style for electronic sources, and in particular, when referencing a periodical. A periodical are items that are published on a regular basis, such as journals, magazines, scholarly newsletters, etc. And of course, in psychology, most of the time we're, we're citing things like uh, journals. So as you can see here in the first box, um, APA uses the uh, surname and then initial approach, followed by a combination of a number of different variations of italicies, sentence case, title case, etc. So let's go through it so you can see what I'm referring to here. All right, so we have our first author, surname, followed by a comma, then a space, then the author's first initial, followed by a period and a space, and then the author's second initial, if it is available, uh, followed by a period, and then a comma, and then a space. And then we have the second author's surname, followed by a comma, space, first initial, period, space, Second initial, again, if it is available, period, comma, space, the ampersand symbol, then the final author, comma, space, first initial, period, space, second initial, period, then a space. Then in brackets, the year that the article was published, close those brackets, period, space. Then we have the title of the article itself. The title of the article, note, is not italicized and it is written in what is called sentence case. That means only the first letter is capitalized. Every other letter is lowercase. Follow that by a period and then a space and then the title of the journal itself or the periodical itself. This is note italicized and it is in what is, what is called title case. In other words, every important word is capitalized. So. Um, for instance, if this was the Journal of Sex Research, then um, journal would be capitalized, of would not be, it's not an important word, sex would be capitalized, and then research would be capitalized. Follow this by a comma, space, the volume number, notice that the volume is italicized, then hugging up close and tight is a bracket, which then separates the volume from the issue number. Notice that the issue number is not italicized. Right, close that bracket and then a comma. Then we have the page numbers separated by a dash. Notice there's no space between that. And then the period, then the space, and then the hyperlinked DOI content. So in previous editions of APA, the sixth edition for instance, all we needed to provide was the, the words DOI and then the number. But APA 7 wants this hyperlinked. So we need to do this HTTPS colon backslash backslash doi.org backslash number. DOI is a document object identifier. So it's a number that gets assigned to every published article. So you can see in the example below, 
uh, we have this format in place, Barnes, JK, Smith, EL, and Whitmire, JM from 2000, power through appointment. So this is the title of the article. Notice it is not italicized and it is in sentence case. Social science research, this is the title of the journal. Notice it is in all caps um, for all important words. In other words, what we call title case, and it is italicized. Then following that is the journal number. So this is journal uh, uh, volume number, sorry, 29. And then um, the issue number, which is two. So notice 29 is italicized, but two, the issue number is not italicized. And notice there's no space between 29 and the bracket. And then no space with the two following. Comma, then the page number. Uh, and then a period at the end of that sentence then the hyperlink content. <laughs> and then, so this has to be hyperlinked. So you can't just type HTTPS. You have to actually uh, highlight it and click uh, add link and hyperlink it in your article. So notice a couple things. You must list the issue number if it is available. So in previous editions of APA you didn't need to list the issue number. You only had to do it if the issues continually started at, if each new issue continually started at page one. Okay, now they want you to uh, list the issue number regardless. Of that. Note also that the label just DOI is no longer necessary, so you must have hyperlink content. And, and a DOI um, should be provided for any works that have a DOI, regardless of, of whether or not you use the online version or the print version. So let's say, for instance, that you went to the library and you found an article in a journal and then you photocopied it and brought it home. Well, you technically don't have the electronic version, but if it has a DOI, you have to cite the DOI. So um, same thing if you if you have a subscription to a journal and it comes to your house and you're laying there on your couch reading an article and you see one that you want to cite in your paper, it doesn't matter that you hold on to the print copy. If there is a dot document object identifier number, then you must provide it and you must provide it like this. If an online work has both a DOI and a URL, a URL so for instance, a URL that goes to a, um, a journal, for instance, then you would only include the DOI and not both. And um, the DOI is always preferred over the URL. Now, if there is no DOI assigned to the online content, then you would include the homepage URL for the journal. As I said on the previous page, that sometimes you may get a, access to a journal because you went through the, or an access to an article because you went through the journal's uh, webpage. Um, so if there's no DOI, but you did track the article down through the journal's URL, then you would include the URL for that for that journal itself. You do not need to include the database. And I see students do this all the time. They provide the database information, retrieved from PsycInfo, retrieved from ERIC. Okay, you don't need to do that. Okay. And no retrieval date is necessary because this is considered to be static content. It's not going to move around or it's not going to be taken down. So you do not need to provide a retrieval date. So you can see that example provided here. In this example by Coy and Pennington, um, the article doesn't have the DOI, it's really old. So um, I got it from the journal's webpage, which is the Journal of Personality and Social Psych. And so I would indicate retrieve from and then provide the hyperlinked, again, has to be hyperlinked, um, journal URL. All right, now what if you are using print sources? So, for instance, um, you know, you have a book on your bookshelf or whatever. Uh, what is the process for print sources? So print sourcing is pretty much the same as electronic, though without the DOI, unless, of course, one is available. So if one is available, like in my previous example, where you happen to go to the library or you happen to get a journal subscription that's sent to your house, then, of course, you would provide the DOI. But let's assume that you have a book or some other periodical that's you know, your parents and is old and it doesn't have a DOI, well, then of course you don't provide one. So it's basically exactly the same where we follow this author A, author B, author C approach with the title of the article not italicized and in sentence case, the title of the periodical italicized and in title case, the volume number and the issue, again, you know, the volume number being italicized, the issue number not being, and then the page number. So it's exactly the same. Just notice that there is no DOI provided here because, of course, one is not provided. And even online, you might find that there are articles that don't have a DOI, um, particularly if, you know, they're older um, and there's no URL to the journal. You know, sometimes that does happen. It does happen in the world, in which case you would just list the reference 
uh, as though this was 1978. And there's no such thing as the internet. All right, what about if you are referencing a non-periodical, so for instance, a book? Again, the method is pretty much the same. You list the author followed by the initials, the year, the title of the work itself. So this is the title of the book. Notice that it is italicized and it is in sentence case. And then you provide the publisher. Uh, you are no longer required to provide the location of the publisher like you did in APA 6. So in APA 7, this is no longer required. So for instance, in the olden days, we would have to put the title of the work and then we would have to put where the, the work was published. So for instance, London or New York or Toronto or whatever. You don't have to do that any now, anymore, any longer. You just need to put the publisher itself. So in this example, Perner J from 1991, Understanding the Representational Mind, published by MIT Press. That's it. What if you are referencing a non-periodical, but you're not referencing the entire book? So for instance, you're referencing only part of the book. So for instance, chapters from a book. Okay, so then what do you do? So again, now you can see we get really particular here. So we have the author A, author B, etc. Same as always. The title of the chapter is treated much like the title of an article in a periodical. So it is not italicized and it is in sentence case. And then you would put the title of the book. Um, if it was just a... Um, just a book, okay, for instance, um, you know, developmental psychology, let's say, you would put the title of the book, and it would be, um, again, uh, weirdly italicized, but not uh, capitalized, so it is now remaining in sentence case, very strange, and then you have the um, pages from the chapter, so let's say it was your textbook, developmental psychology, and you just looked at, you know, the pages from chapter uh, five or whatever, and it was, um, you know, 414 to 452, whatever, then you would put that. Now, also in this example, I've included what you do if you're citing a book that has been edited. So everything stays the same at the beginning, right? So we have the uh, author, author year, the title of the chapter, and then now we have to indicate the editors. So now we say in a editor, so this is the editor's first initial, and then their surname, then a comma, then a space, then the second editor's first initial, and then their surname, and then a comma, and then a space, and then and using the ampersand symbol, and then the third editor's first initial, and then their surname, and then a space. And then you include EDS with a capital E, okay, so that indicates um, that these are the editors, EDS followed by a period, and that bracket, then a comma, then a space, then the title of the book and the pages, and then you provide the publisher. So in this example down in the second box, I've gotten even a little more detailed. So here we have Costello and Angold in 2000. I'm citing the chapter, which is called Developmental Epidemiology, a Framework for Developmental Psychopathology. Notice this is title case. Okay, so in other words, uh, only the first uh, letter is capitalized here. But also note, because there is a colon that is provided here, I now capitalize the next word following the colon, and that is always the case, for the record, in the reference list. This chapter comes from an edited book, so the editors are A. Samaroff, M. Lewis, and S. Miller. These are the editors, so I've specified that. And then we have the title of the book, which is the Handbook of Developmental Psychopathology. You notice that that is italicized to separate it from the title of the chapter but it is still in sentence case, so only the capital uh, first word is capitalized. And then I've been indicated that this is a second edition. So notice in the second edition, you put second, and then you put ED with a small e uh, to distinguish that from the editors with a capital E. And notice there's no S on the end because it's edition, not editions or editors. Okay. And then period, comma, and then the page numbers. And then, of course, the publisher, which is Planner. So in this example, it's a second edition. So we put that in brackets before the page numbers. If it was a first edition, you wouldn't have to comment on this because it's the only edition. Okay, so we, it would just be the page numbers in the brackets. All right, what if you're referencing reports or documents or something along those lines from a private organization or from a corporation? So here we have, uh, again, the same format with the author's surname, initials, and year, the title of the book or the document or the report or whatever it is. Notice it's italicized and it is in sentence case. 
and then the publisher. So I've gotten a little fancy in the second example um, to show you what you would do if you were citing something from, say, the American Psychiatric Association, like, for instance, the DSM-5 or whatever. So in this example, we have the American Psychiatric Association. That is the organization, the um, year that it is published, practice guidelines for the treatment of patients with eating disorders. Notice it's italicized and it is in second case. Then I've put second edition to make it a little complicated. And then I've put the publisher and in brackets here, I put author. Now you don't put publisher and then author. If you were citing this reference, you would just put American Psychiatric Association. The publisher is the author in that case. And that same thing applies if you're referencing the DSM. So the DSM, you would put American Psychiatric Association uh, 2015, uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, in brackets you would put fifth edition, and then the publisher would be APA. That's who published the DSM. Okay, so again, this is a second edition, which you put in brackets after the title, a first edition, you wouldn't have to do that. And if the corporation and the publisher are the same thing, then um, you would put APA as both author and publisher. But of course, that's not always going to be the case. So sometimes you're publishing some kind of corporate document, but the publisher is, I don't know, Sage or whatever, then you would put Sage. Okay? But I think this is a good example because many people cite the DSM-5 in psychology. Okay, what about websites? Well, it varies uh, depending on whether or not you have the date or you don't have the date. So let's talk about websites with the date and how we would do it in text. So in, the gist is to provide enough information for your readers to be able to find the source. So in this example, we have the, 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 the actual results uh, being discussed first. So the authors would be in brackets. To prevent kidney failure, patients should get active, quit smoking, and take medications as directed. Um, this is from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website from 2017, and it's from the section called, What Can You Do? Okay, so I've tried to be as explicit as I can for the readers so that if they go to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website from 2017, they can find the What Can You Do section and see this source. How would you cite websites with a date in the reference list? Well, it's pretty much the same approach, although now we've got things like uh, actual dates of the, uh, the information being loaded to the website. So we have the author here, Avramova, from 2019, January 3rd. So as explicit as you can possibly be, notice that's separated by a comma and a space. The secret to a long, happy, healthy life, think age positive. This comes from CNN World. Okay, so this is the website, CNN World, and then this is the author who wrote the article about the secret to a long and happy, healthy life. And then, of course, you would include the hyperlink to this article, which was put up by Amra Mova on January 3rd, 2019, on the website CNN World. What happens if the websites have no date for the stuff that you're citing? All right, so a few different options here. So here we have an uh, article by um, uh, posted on a website by Bodie, Newman, Jennings, Morrow, etc. Following the authors, you would put in brackets N period, D period, no spaces in there to signify that there is no date for this article called Ethics Principles, the Research Ethics Guidebook, a resource for social scientists. Okay, this Ethics Principles, the Research Ethics Guidebook, was found on this website. So this is a hyperlinked website, right? and there is no date for this source. So I would specify no date. Now, if I was citing this parenthetically uh, in the text itself, I would indicate it as this. Bodhi et al. period, comma, space, n period, d period. No date. If I was citing it in terms of narrative, so for instance, I was talking about the authors first, then I would go Bodhi et al. period, and then in brackets, N period, D period, specifying no date. Here's another example. This is an organization, National Nurses United. There is, again, no date. What employers should do to protect nurses from Zika, then the actual hyperlink to that article. And again, parenthetically, I would put National Nurses United, ND, indicating no date. And narratively, I would put National Nurses United and then no date in brackets. 
Alrighty, what to do if you are referencing internet message boards, blog posts, electronic mailing lists, etc., etc. Um, okay, so first off, if an author's name is provided, you should provide an author's name. In some cases, the author's name may not be provided and there's only a screen name, like in this example here, in which case you would provide the screen name. So in our first example, we have an author, Smith ML, uh, 1999 in April. Um, again, there's no specific uh, day in April that was provided, so I give as much resources uh, and mu as much information as I can in order to try to track this down. Investigation of the use of mobile phones while driving. In a hard bracket, I indicate to the reader that this was a blog post and that it was retrieved on December 22nd, 2020 from this a date hasn't even appeared yet in our life um, at this point. And then I would provide the hyperlink. So note that you include a retrieval date only when the content is designed to change over time and the page is not archived, as is the case with blog posts, electronic mailing lists, and the internet message boards, etc. Okay, so those are usually um, not designed to maintain permanence. The page might be moved or taken down, in which case then you would have to indicate when you found it. So that if a person went to try to find the source and it was gone, they would um, be able to look at your reference list and go, oh, this was retrieved on such and such a date, and that's probably why it's missing. Okay, so uh, note also, hyperlinks are to the content itself, so it's it goes directly to the content, and that's always the case, right? So whenever you're putting in hyperlinked material, it should always be to the content itself. In our second example, we have a screen name, Middle Kid, and I've also made it fancy uh, by indicating that there was no date provided for this post. And the post was called Notable People in Psychology of Religion. In hard brackets, I specify what kind of post it was. This was an online forum comment. And it was retrieved September 8th, 2020 from this hyperlinked content. Okay, so again, I have indicated that I retrieved it on a particular date because specifying that this could change and be taken down if the page isn't archived. Notice that in both cases, there are no italics on the title of the post. So investigation of the use of mobile phones while driving and notable people in psychology of religion are not italicized, which is a little bit different from previous cases where we have italicized, um, in some cases, at least the title that, like in the case of a book, for instance, where I've italicized the title of the book. So there's no italics here. All right, what if there is no author? <laughs> Sometimes that happens when you're on a web page. How do you organize it in the reference list? How do you reference it in text? Well, in this case, then the title of the post moves to the first position of the reference list. So for instance, um, there's no author for this first example. The title of the article is called The New Child Vaccine Gets Funding Boost um, from 2001. I've specified that I retrieved that on August 24th, 2019 from this hyperlinked content. Uh, again, I've specified the retrieval date because this might be taken down, it might be moved, it's not an archive page like a journal would be or a DOI content would be. And because there's no author, new is the, you know, for the, 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 the author, okay? New child vaccine is considered the author. So I would put this in the reference list under um, the letter N. In the text, I would cite uh, the first few words of the reference list entry. And this is, of course, usually the title uh, when there's no author and the year. So um, for instance, let's say I said blah, 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 something about vaccines. Then in brackets, I would put new child vaccine. Notice that I put quotation marks around that to specify that this is the, uh, not an author, but um, the title of the article. And then I put the year 2001. What if you're citing something from YouTube? If you're citing something from YouTube, again, you try to put the, uh, you put the author, um, or the, um, again, if there's no author, if there's no author provided, then the title of the video would suffice. I try to provide as much content inf information as I can about uh, the year that it was published, including the date. I've put the title of the video, and then in hard brackets, I indicate that it is a video, and then I say the source from whence the video was retrieved with hyperlink content. So for instance, in this example, the University of Oxford is considered the author, because there is no author. Uh, from 2018, December 6th, the University of Oxford posted a video called How Do Geckos Walk on Water? Okay. And then I put um, that it is a video and that I indicated that it is retrieved from YouTube. And then I provide the hyperlinked content right to that YouTube video.
Here I've taken a table right from the APA 7th edition to provide you um, who you would include as authors for various types of audiovisual. So um, if you're citing a film, like a movie, then you would specify the director as the author. If you're citing a TV series, the whole series, then you would specify the executive producers as the author. If you're citing an episode of a TV series, then the writer and the director is considered the author of that episode. If you're referencing a podcast, then the host or the executive producer suffice as the author. If it's a specific episode of a podcast, then the host of the episode is considered the author. And if you're citing a webinar, then the instructor is considered the author. So in this case, you would cite me for this APA, you know, workshop. So some examples, I've given you uh, a couple. Um, we've got um, the author, as indicated on the previous slide, and then the title of that author. So that title might be the director, or it might be the uh, executive producer, or it might be the host of the podcast. Okay, so the title of the author is indicated in brackets, and then following that is the year. Then we have the title of the film or the TV series or the podcast or whatever it is. And then in brackets, hard brackets, you would put what it is. So if it's a film or it's a TV series or it's an episode or it's a podcast or it's a webinar and then the production company, etc. So as much information as, as you can provide about who developed this particular podcast or webinar or film series or whatever. So, for instance, Foreman M is the director in 1975 of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So you'll notice um, that this is italicized as specified here, and it is in uh, sentence case. Then in hard brackets, I've specified that this is a film, and then this was produced by United Artists. In this example here, we have Simon, Colesbury, and Crosstalk Noble. These are the executive producers from 2002 to 2008 for The Wire, which is a TV series. So I specify in hard brackets that I am citing the entire series. And then I provide as much information about the production company uh, as I can. So this was produced by Blown Deadline and it was aired on HBO. Notice that's separated by a semicolon. Okay, so that wraps up part two. Now we can move on to part three, which is the APA typographical style. So as I said at the beginning of this um, workshop, APA is not just a, a method of citing sources with a reference list and in-text citation. It is also a method of style. So in order for something to be considered appropriately APA formatted, it needs to look a particular way. So we're going to begin with the title page. What should the title page look like? The title page needs to be on a separate page from the rest of the document. In other words, when you put the title page in, you have to hit page break and move on to a brand new clean page of paper. So the title page has to stand on its own, on its own page. A short title can be included in the header, and if included, it should look like this, short title. So notice it is all capitals, and it should be short, so 15 words or less. The short title included in the header is flush left okay, at the top of the header, and it is typed in uppercase, as I indicated. Following that, there should be in the same header, the page number in the upper right hand corner, and then beginning with one and following throughout the text. So this is true for the short title and the page number. So the short title and the page number in the header should be on every single page, okay, and it starts at page one. Now, APA specifies that student papers are no longer required to have the short title in the header, uh, but it is up to individual professors. So my advice to you would be to always include the short title in the header, followed by the page number, flush right, because you never know if your prof is going to be APA particular, and it is better to err on the side of caution and be as consistent with APA formatting as possible, rather than get nailed by your prof for not including appropriate title page with header and page numbers. So once you've got the header in there, then you can move on to the title itself. The title should be in title case. Remember that means that every important word is capitalized. It is centered and bolded on the page and it is positioned in the upper half. You do a hard return and you indicate the byline, which is your name. And if you want, you can 
include other things like the title of the course or the prop's name or whatever the case may be. Then you're going to do a page break so that you can move on to the next page, entirely fresh new page. No, don't go return, 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 return. And don't start typing right on the title page. You should have a clean page and then right breaking down to a brand new page for page two. Following the title page is an abstract. Now, most papers that you write for class, like, uh, you know, like, you know, critical thinking papers or, you know, film reviews or, you know, personal blog and journal entries or whatever your profs got you doing, you don't need an abstract. So an abstract is generally reserved for research-based papers that you're writing. So papers that, you know, sort of summarize the gist of the entire paper. You don't need to do that for, for most run-of-the-mill papers, but if you have a research paper, you do. So the abstract, again, begins on a new page. It's identified by the short title in the header. Of course, that's in uppercase, flush left. And the page number, um, which would now be page two, flush right. And as I indicate, these are both in the header. You would type abstract in title case, in other words, capital A, centered and bolded at the top of the page. And then you would hit return and you would begin typing the abstract in a single paragraph block format. In other words, do not indent the abstract. So the abstract should be flush left. You begin the abstract with the most important information, which is, for instance, the purpose of the study. You would include only four or five of the most important concepts or findings. So most abstracts are restricted to anywhere between 150 to 250, maybe 300 words, but generally caps, tap, taps out at 250 words, so it needs to be concise. So four or five of the most important concepts or findings should be included in the abstract, such as what you found and you know, what are the implications and, you know, that kind of thing. And then you, um, when you finish writing your abstract, you hit return and you now need to provide a few, a few key words. So you would hit the indent button. You would write the word keywords. Notice that it is capitalized and it is italicized and it is followed by a colon. And then you would type the keywords. So for instance, children, attention, emotion, uh, whatever, maybe as many as five, those are not italicized. So keywords is italicized, but children, attention, and emotion are not italicized. And they are um, separated, by the way, by, co by uh, commas. Once you are done the abstract, you're going to insert a page break, and then you're going to move on to a new page, clean page, page three, and um, this is where you begin writing your paper. Now take note that APA requires double space throughout, right, throughout. So that means all your manuscript itself must be double spaced. Um, the references must be double spaced and tables must be double spaced. Although sometimes um, if you're submitting for publication, journal editors will let you get away with 1.5, but to be safe, double space. So everything in double space. You begin your paper, um, as I said on this new page, the short title should be there in uppercase, flush left, and the page number should be there, flush right, at the top of the page, and of course this should now be page three. And then you type the title of the paper itself. Um, this is in title case, it's centered and bolded, and it's at the very top of the page, so no returns, right at the very top of the page. So what I recommend is you scroll on back to your title page, you copy the title, then you scroll forward, and you paste it into the top of page three. Then you hit return, and you begin typing. Now the first line should be indented on the next line. So some other particulars about um, typing your manuscript or your paper. There is one space following a period. This is true in either the text or in the references. There is one space following a colon or a semicolon in either text or the references. Unless following that colon, the next word is a complete sentence, in which case you would capitalize the next word. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, this is also true for titles. So if you're, if you're uh, in the reference list, you're typing a title of a article and it's let's say um, uh, gender reveal parties colon what they reveal about transphobia then G and gender reveal would be capitalized 
um, and then the colon, and then what they reveal about transphobia, the W in what would be capitalized. Okay, so that's always going to be the case. And in the text itself, if the, um, if the sentence following the colon is a complete sentence, then you would capitalize the beginning of that word following that colon. Otherwise, one space. I mean, um, otherwise, um, lowercase, pardon me. Further text information, when you're writing results sections, all statistical notation must be italicized. So this includes P for probability, N, degrees of freedom, F, T, R, mean, standard deviation, standard errors, etc. The exception to this are Greek symbols. So eta, alpha, mu, beta, any Greek symbol is not italicized. Every other statistical symbol is italicized. There is one space between all the symbols and values reported in a statistic except before the degrees of freedom. So for instance, you can see this example here. So we have F, it's italicized. There is a bracket, no space. The degrees of freedom are listed and they are separated here with a period or with a space, by the way. Then we end the bracket, we have a space, then we have the equal sign, we have a space, we have the number two, we have a period, we have 81, comma, then we have a space, P, notice it's italicized, and we have a space, you get the gist, okay? So um, one space between all the symbols and values reported in a statistic except before the degrees of freedom. And this is true if it's T, so it's let's say T, no space, bracket, 52, end bracket, then a space, then equals, then, you know, 31, whatever. You report exact p-values unless p in SPSS is equal to 0 0.000. Then you would report p is less than 0 0.001, and that's because probability can never be zero. So you, uh, even though SPSS puts equal to 0, 0, 0, there's no such thing as probability be equaling zero. So you would have to put p is less than 0 0.001. On the next slide, I give you an example of how many decimal points you need to provide for statistics. So here you can see that for numbers that are greater than 100, you would round to the whole number. So in SPSS, they might provide 1034.963, you would report 1035. For numbers between 10 and 100, one decimal place. So for instance, 11.4378, you would indicate as 11.4 one decimal space. And by the way, you would round up to 11.5 if it was 40, 48, for instance. For numbers between 0.10 and 10, two decimal places are provided. So for instance, 4.3682 would be reported as 4.37, two decimal places. For 0.001 to 0.10, three decimal places. So if SPSS reported 0 0.0352, you would indicate 0 0.035. And for numbers less than 0 0.001, as many digits as needed uh, for something that is, again, non-zero, okay, or more appropriately, you could say if it was, um, if P in SPSS was equal to 0 0.000, you would have to make it P less than 0 0.001. Can never be a zero. There's no such thing as no probability. Okay, moving on. In the results section, you should provide a verbal conclusion for each statistical test you discuss. This doesn't have to be extensive. It's not an extensive um, discussion of, of what you found or why you found it. That's for the discussion section. It's just a quick reiteration of your findings. So for instance, if you said F is equal to blah, 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 P is less than 0.05, then you would say um, there were statistically significant differences between these groups, something quick. In the results section, you must also develop your own tables. Do not copy and paste tables from SPSS because SPSS tables are not in APA format. And that's really the whole point of this workshop is, is to adhere to APA uh, rules and regulations. So SPSS provides tables that look like this. Okay, so you know an ANOVA table would have a box, and then it would have these horizontal lines like that, separating, um, you know, for instance, um, the you know between versus within, 
And then it has these vertical lines like this, so that you've got, you know, the mean square, and then you got the F value, and then you got the significance values. APA does not like vertical lines. APA is fine with horizontal lines like this, so you would go blah, 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 but it does not like these vertical rules like this. So, um, you can't copy and paste tables from SPSS because they're not in APA format. Further, SPSS doesn't have APA formatted titles for the tables. So in APA, you're supposed to put table one and then you hit return and then you type the title of the table. So descriptive statistics, that needs to be italicized. Uh, table one needs to be bolded. That is not done in SPSS. So if you were to just copy and paste a table from SPSS, it would violate all kinds of APA rules. So don't do it. Okay, continuing with text, uh, all numbers under 10 must be spelled out, except when they are paired with numbers over 10. So for instance, three of 21 analyses, then you can keep the three, even though it is under 10 um, as a number, because it's paired with a number that is over 10. And all numbers in statistics are fine uh, to be just numbers, even if they are under 10. So for instance, uh, two by three design, you can keep as two by three, even though those numbers are under 10. So if numbers are under 10, uh, unless in statistics, they have to be spelled out. All numbers that begin a sentence must also have to be spelled out. So I would avoid this. So for instance, if you're typing out um, 231 participants, you have to, you know, and you, you start the sentence that way, 231 participants, uh, you're supposed to spell out 231 <laughs> because they're at the beginning of the sentence. Okay, So it doesn't matter that they're over 10. If they're at the beginning of a sentence, they're supposed to be spelled out. So this just looks stupid. So I would avoid beginning numbers or beginning a sentence with numbers because it looks dumb to type out, you know, 231. So um, I would change the sentence so that it doesn't begin with a number. So for instance, instead of saying 231 participants, you could say participants included 231 men and women or 231 um, individuals over 56 or whatever the hell you know you're doing but you get the gist so to avoid having to type out numbers at the beginning of a sentence just don't have numbers at the beginning of a sentence um, now what about some um, gists about grammar so when a complete sentence is enclosed in parentheses the punctuation should go inside the parentheses like this Okay, so this is a complete sentence, and so the punctuation, in other words, the period, goes inside the parentheses. If only part of a sentence is enclosed in parentheses, like this, then the punctuation goes outside of the parentheses, like this. In terms of writing, you should use past tense or perfect present tense to express an action or condition that occurred in the past. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So when you're discussing another researcher's work, that should be past tense. When you're reporting your results, that should be past tense um, or perfect present tense if possible. What about quotation marks? So when do you use double quotation marks? You use double quotation marks when you're quoting a direct source. Um, as I said before, you need to provide page numbers for the direct source and you should only do this when um, you know, you're trying to make a point or for some kind of effect. Direct quotes should be used sparingly, but when they are used, you use double quotation marks. You use double quotation marks when you're introducing an ironic concept, slang, or a coined expression. So, for instance, normal behavior, for instance, is in double quotation marks, but you would only do that for the first occurrence. So once you've said normal behavior, then afterwards it would just be normal behavior without any quotation marks. Do not use double quotation marks to identify, identify anchors on a scale. So, for instance, let's say you're talking about a Likert scale that goes from 0 to 5. Um, you may type the scale ranged from zero, and then let's say you want to describe that zero means disagree, to five, and five maybe means um, strongly agree. So your inclination might be to put zero, and then in quotation marks, disagree, to five, and then in quotation marks, strongly agree. Don't do that. What you do instead is you use italics. So you would say the scale ranged from zero, and then in brackets, you would put disagree and that would be I, I, uh, italicized to five and then in brackets you would put strongly disagree and that would be italicized so do not use quotation marks to identify anchors on a scale do not use quotation marks for block quotes these are quotes that are more than 40 words 
Um, instead, if you're doing a direct quote that's 40, more than 40 words, you would hit the return button, you would indent five spaces, and then you would type the quote. And um, every line would be indented five spaces. So there, it would be blocked in five spaces, the entire 40 line quote. Um, to a 40 word quote to indicate that the whole thing is a quote and then of course you would put the page numbers following that quote. Do not use quotation marks to hedge. So for instance to, in this example right from APA manual the teacher rewarded the class with tokens so what you're kind of suggesting there is that the tokens weren't a reward at all. You don't do that so you don't use quotation marks to hedge. You would just type the teacher rewarded the class with tokens. All right, and then finally we have a, a look, this is taken right from the APA 7th edition manual, we have a look at headings, how headings are used in a manuscript. So I've already alluded to headings quite a bit when I told you about the rules for doing a title page and doing rules for putting your title of your paper on the third page. Um, there are five levels of headings in APA 7. The first level is the centered bold title case heading. So for instance, on page three, when you first, first start typing your paper, you have the title of your paper centered, bolded, and in title case. That's considered a level one heading. And then you hit the return button and you start typing your paper on the next line as a new paragraph. Now let's say that um, midway through your um, you know, introduction to your paper, you want to introduce some specific research focus. So let's say you want to talk about a particular line of research and you title that, um, um, I don't know, uh, di differences between men and women. And you want to title the next section with this particular focus, differences between men and women, in which case then you have now introduced a second level heading. So differences between men and women would be flush left, bolded, and title cased. And then you would hit return and you would begin talking about the differences between men and women in the literature on uh, in a new paragraph that is indented. Um, now, let's say you want to introduce um, a measure. Um, let's say so, you know, in your introduction, you got your title of your paper level uh, level one heading. And then you talk about differences between men and women. That's a level two heading. And let's say you talk about uh, differences across age groups. That's an, another level two heading in your introduction. And then you move on to, let's say now it's your method section. So method would be centered, bold, and capitalized. So that would be a level one heading. And then you put participants. That would be a level two heading. So it's a flush left, bold, title case. And then you'd hit return and talk about your participants. And then let's say you say measures. So that's also now a level two heading. So measures would be flush left, bolded with a capital M. But then you want to talk about a particular measure. So now you're talking about the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. So the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, the title of that would be flush left, bold italics and capitalized in title case. So following measures, you would hit return and say Rosenberg self-esteem scale. And that would be flush left italics bolded with Rosenberg self esteem and scale all capitalized. So now you've got three levels of headings. Okay? So one that sort of captures um, each section. Level four is where you have now indented. It's bold. It's title case. So everything's capitalized and it ends with a period. And then the text begins on the same line and continues as a regular paragraph. And then level five is where you have indented. It's still bold, but now it's italicized. It's still title case, so everything's capitalized and it ends with a period again. And the text begins on the same line. It continues as a regular paragraph. So five different levels of heading. Now, most papers will use probably up to three. So most research papers will use probably up to three, maybe four levels of headings. Most student papers top out in and around two levels of headings. Okay? So it's appropriate to use the levels of headings um, correctly in order for your paper to be considered APA formatted. All right, so that pretty much wraps up the lecture or rather workshop on APA style um, in the seventh edition. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you found this useful and helpful and I'm available via email for questions, but I would also recommend that you, um, I had students ask me, what is my best resource for APA formatting? 
uh, my suggestions for best resource. My suggestion for a best resource would be the APA manual itself. So if you can get a copy of the APA publication manual, that's probably your best bet. Um, other sources are out there. The library's got sources. And there's lots of websites. Um, APA.org is a very good source where you can get appropriate APA information. And Purdue OWL, I think, is pretty good as well, although I don't know if they're up to date with the 7th edition. So there are lots of sources. There is absolutely no reason, there is absolutely no excuse for not being able to correctly cite and reference and format in APA style. Lots of resources are available. Thank you so much, and um, thank, uh, peace out.